Hi, everybody. This is Mark Chaffardini with Go See Talk. Thanks for coming back to the Go See Talk podcast experience. And we are going to hit fast forward on this interview with Greg Bjorkman, the co-writer and director of Press Play. A really fun time travel movie, not like anything you're used to seeing before. Why do you like records so much? You have this tangible thing right there in front of you. I love that. Why don't I have something for you. You are now recording the very first song on our mixtape. So, Greg, uh, welcome to the show. How's things in your world? It's doing doing well. The movie just came out. It feels good to, to finally be able to share it with the world. Excellent, excellent. And I, I see based on your setup, it looked like you've been doing a lot of press. You've got the smooth tone. You got the microphone near your face. You like do radio all you know, day. I, you know, I got this mic over uh, over the pandemic because uh, you know I was just I just wanted to mess around a little bit with uh, with pro audio and you know uh, before filming uh, when we were pitching the project, uh, Logan told me and Logan Lerman told me you should do. You've got a very soothing voice. You should do uh, you should do voiceovers or something. So I was like, okay, yeah, I'll get the mic and see, see where that takes me. <laughs> it's great when an actor tells you that too, right? Yeah. Yeah. Especially if, yeah, especially if it's a guy who's, who's made a bunch already. <laughs> well, Greg, what, um, before we get into press play, I'd like to know just a little bit yeah. more about your, uh, your VXX, VFX background and, and what, you know, what your specialties and hobbies are before you got into the director's chair. So I started in this industry in editorial. Uh, actually, that, that was the, the, the biggest start that I had. Um, I had worked previously in some music videos as a PA and on uh, American Idol as a PA. So you think you can dance as a PA. Um, but, you know, when I worked on this one music video um, uh, with Jason Kisvarde, um, who's a production designer, uh, just just had a movie come out, everything, everywhere, all at once. Um, he works with the Daniels. When I worked on a music video way back in, I think it was like 2010 or 2011, um, I was talking to him and I, I, I got some really good advice, which was, you know, if, if you're going to, if you, if you know where you want to end up in the industry, you try to get at least in the same department as quick as possible uh, because you don't want to be stuck as a PA because uh, people can get stuck as a PA. And so I said, all right, well, I think the easiest way to get to directing is maybe through a smaller group of people. And that would be through editorial because I'll be in the room uh, with the director. Whereas if I was on set, there's, you know, hundreds of people potentially, and you know, you have a job to do. And if you don't do the job, you're going to have somebody that's in between you and the director you know, scold you for not uh, doing your job when you're trying to like just watch what's happening. And so I, I decided that I would try to get to editorial. And uh, I had taken been taking classes uh, at uh, UW-Milwaukee uh, before I moved out here, um, where I had basically learned, you know, how to, you know, create visual effects and stuff on my own um, and taught myself editing as well. And then when I came out here, I continued uh, to go to school for a little bit and took an editing class. Um, and I, I, my hunch is that the professor that I talked to sent my, my resume to an editor that was uh, repped by his agent. And uh, then that got forwarded to, to Rob. And that's how I ended up in editorial for uh, Stuck in Love. And um, yeah, so I, I, I'm self-taught when it comes to visual effects. Um, I went the, you know, Andrew Kramer route where I would like watch all the, the entertaining videos that he would put out as well as uh, trying to learn stuff on, on YouTube. Um, you know, I, I went to school for uh, cinematography. Uh, didn't tell anybody that I wanted to be a director because there was a lot of people that were saying that they wanted to be directors. And, you know, I didn't want to be grouped into that category of people who are wannabe directors. Um, so I kept that to myself and just tried to learn as much as possible. Okay. Well, I feel like I'm, I have two, two possible ways I can go. Maybe if I, if it doesn't go right, 
I could use the time machine to go back and ask the, the correct question. But let's lead off with the uh, the VX, VFX because there's something sure. really kind of cute and charming about the end of the movie. The screener I got actually showed some, I guess, some stock footage or some dailies where they didn't have the effects put in. It was like you oh. see a phone with a background, but the messages weren't there or something was oh. on a computer. Even though when she typed in, um, when Laura typed in questions about time travel in the Google, the Google page showed up, but none of the effects of actually typing out the question. Oh, interesting. So can you can you speak more to that? Like, did you, as aside from being a director, did you have any input on the, the effects of this movie? Yeah, so I did. I did a couple of the finals actually for uh, for the for the film. Um, it's in the trailer, so it's not a spoiler. But uh, I did the the shot where Harrison gets hit by hit by the car, um, as well as some other stuff uh, throughout the film, like some screens um, and then some just uh, some fixes here and there, uh, split screens and such. But uh, yeah, you know, it's funny because as a director, you know, you, you kind of want to know all the departments and having known visual effects, uh, you know, you go into shooting a, a scene like that and you want to be more concerned about performance at that point. So it was nice to have uh, Brad Parker, uh, who's also a director, uh, come in and just kind of supervise uh, the visual effects for that. Um, he allowed me to get the performance out of actors when I needed to, uh, when there were visual effects scenes, like for instance, the, uh, the, the motion control arm where, uh, Laura gets sucked up towards the ceiling. Um, that was, uh, that was a fun sequence. And like, I don't think it would be the same if Brad <laughs> was not there. <laughs> so it's, it's good to, it's, it's, it's good to have, you know, the takeaway I think is it's good to have those, those types of, you know, those people that you can count on. And trust uh, uh, for 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 those roles to be able to get the movie that you want out of it. Well, what are your experiences working with um, with Laura and and Harrison in character? Because one of the one of the best, mm. uh, let's call it an effect, is um, yeah. is actually not an effect. It's a single take shot in a bowling alley. And I want to say yeah. it's like a two or three minute scene. So what was you know what was your yeah. experience setting that up? The logistics of it, and how many times did it take? Well, you know, it's funny because like you make decisions on the day uh, about, you know, time and what, how much time you have is, you know, very small <laughs> relative to, to the day for, for shooting. Uh, and when we, when we shot that scene, um, I felt like this was one of those opportunities where the actors could showcase, you know, what they could do. And you know, showcase the emotions that they, that they, um, you know, they, they, they could bring to this, bring to the screen um, and what they felt about the story. And so I, I intentionally made it a one -er. Um And, you know, it wasn't a Spielberg one because there's nobody that's crossing frame, which makes it a challenge for the actors. But I had already seen plenty of what they were capable of doing and so going into that scene, I knew that we would be fine. Um, and we did do a, a number of takes uh, to, to get the one that, that, I, that I thought was like, this is it. Um, and I think we, we might've might run out of time to do some, some, um, some other stuff in that particular scene, um, just like some or actually in the preceding actually so we filmed we filmed that scene at the same day i think at, or maybe it was back to back days because because scenes were duplicated um we we were in locations twice or maybe one day so i think the first half of the day we filmed uh some stuff i think we might have filmed that scene and then the second half we filmed the previous scene um so it was it was quite a challenge to do um you know to 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 do everything in such a small amount of time. Um, so the one -er was both uh, an option to save some time for us uh, in setups, but it was also an opportunity to, to, to have the actors show off their abilities because they, they did, they did an amazing job. Oh, I agree. And, and a lot of that too, I wonder how much of that is rehearsed versus spontaneous because there's another scene where, um, where Harrison and Laura are in, um, they're painting 
and Harrison yeah. paints uh, Laura's face and it actually looks like a pretty genuine response. Like she didn't expect that to happen. And so we might've captured gold. So, uh, you know, was that something that you did rehearse or are they just that good at reacting? You know, uh, Clara is an incredible actor. Um, that I believe was scripted. Um, but the, I think one of the the magics of of movie making is that you can go into a day and have a plan, but then you can make some changes uh, like on the fly. And sometimes those changes make the spontaneity of the choice, uh, you know, come to life a little bit more. So um, for instance, I think that I'm not sure if the, I mean, there's, there's plenty of stuff in the movie where, uh, you know, there's, there's spontaneity, but like the paint fight, for instance, I'm not sure if we had scripted it, run it, them running out into the rain, but you know, that was, uh, it was a fun little moment for, for the two of them to, to, to play with. Well, aside from time travel, which I, I'd love to dive into, but there's some actually more important themes, um, in the film, there's yeah. sort of the duality of, uh, of people's worldviews and your life experiences, um, sort of colliding because if I get this right, so um, Laura lost her dad when she was 15 and he taught her art. So she's kind of a free mm -hmm. spirit. And then Harrison is gonna go to medical school where it's all about you know regimen and science and stuff. So the fact that they yeah. came together in the first place is a nice juxtaposition, but it also goes a little further as to the decisions they make and whether they're, they're gonna stay together. Um, I guess all that said, um, when you're, when you're, um, when you're hiring both Lewis and, and, and Clara for these roles, I guess, how much does, do they have to, the characters need to embody, I'm sorry, the actors need to embody the character to make these things come to life? You know, that's a very good question because, um, I would argue that it's extremely important to have an actor in a role that can put a little bit of themselves into that role. Um, it makes it more real, uh, more believable. Um, you know, meeting with both of them, you know, uh, Clara, Clara, I knew, uh, just from, you know, watching I am mother and seeing like what her other films and, and, and shows that she's worked on previously were, I knew that she had, um, this certain element and then meeting with, with, with Lewis, I knew that he had, uh, you know, a, a similar share of that element. So, and th th that element is like being able to be true to yourself and the character at the same time. Um, and I think that that's a, extremely important when it comes to, to acting is, you know, there, there are, you know, method actors who put a little bit of, you know, a craziness to it, but like the emotional stories uh, that are told on film need, need to have as much truth to them as possible. And so being able to find actors that, you know, have that, that true line um, is really important for a film like this. Very important. Mm -hmm. Well, let, let's go back to your, your editing background. I think that one of the, I find an actually, a, I think a parallel between your role as a director and maybe um, Laura and her experience. I mean, she, she goes to an art show and really puts herself out there. So you're, as a director, you're putting yourself out there. Um, what, I guess, what confidence or what did you learn as an editor or somebody who was close to what you wanted to do to help you bridge the gap between uh, wants and actually now being the man in charge? You know, it's funny because you, you go into uh, directing a project after having written it, uh, expecting, uh, you know, it to, I mean, there, there's a lot of anxieties with, with going into filming, but there's something that also, um, you know, I kind of learned as a, as a kid, uh, by playing musical instruments and auditioning for things, um, is that you can have as much nerves going into, you know, directing or, you know, auditioning for something, uh, as you want, but as soon as you start doing it, you know, you'll be fine. Like it's, it's literally like getting on a bicycle after not being on a bicycle for a long time. And just, you know, you know, it, you know, it, it's just, it's, it's, it's just the nerves of, you know, doubt. And I think that we all kind of 
you know, uh, experience that as, as artists, uh, and making something like putting something out in the world is, is a very, um, you know, scary thing, but you know, if you don't put anything out in the world, are you really living, you know, like, can you, can you go through life so reserved that, uh, you know, you don't take any chances. I think that if you're, you're not really living, if you, if you don't take chances. And I don't know, maybe I'm getting too philosoph- philosophical here, but uh, that's that's just the way that I that I view it. No, I, th- I think you, you hit on something that um, w- one of my favorite movies is Three Kings. And there's a part in uh, David O. Russell's movie where Spike Jones and George Clooney are having a conversation. And um, so George Clooney tells um, Spike Jones's character, well, you do the thing you're scared of first and then you get the courage afterwards. And so Spike's responsible. That's a pretty bass backwards way of doing it. But I think that kind of like you said, you know, you need to just get out there. And uh, I mean, lucky for you, this movie turned out to be tremendously entertaining and successful. And um, but, you know, what did you lean more on? Was it, did you feel like you're leaning more on on the themes of time travel, the, the, the abilities of the actors, you know, your own personal sensibilities? Um. So, I mean, when we wrote the script, we definitely based our time travel on uh, Back to the Future. But knowing that there's going to be a lot of people out there that try to poke holes in your logic and, uh, you know, making sure that that's really, you know, well situated is, is, a, is a very important aspect of the story. But having seen movies like About Time, which do have time travel in them but i wouldn't almost i would almost consider that secondary to the story uh you know it's more of the vessel for telling this uh this story of loss um knowing that that you could fill those uh holes that someone may poke in the time travel with you know emotional elements that you know make the story you know believable and what it is kind of gave us a little bit of confidence in 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 that in that regard uh for shooting it and and making and putting this project out there um so maybe i'm maybe i misremembered what your question was um, I, I don't even listen to myself i i'm just we're, we're rolling <laughs> this is this is fun we're jazzing um well yeah. uh, but more on that note i did like the fact that it felt more like you know time travel as a conceit sometimes becomes so beholden to a device or you know to some theory like time dilation or something like that. But this was Mm -hmm. just, this felt like the nicer version of a butterfly effect or something like that to where you're, you know, you're using these emotions to sort of get you through to where you want to be like uh, manifesting time travel, so to speak. Yeah. I, uh, you know, it's funny because I talked to James, my co-writer the other day and we were reminiscing on on the writing process. And there was a, a moment that we both remember where uh we had we, we we would watch movies and stuff on our own to and then come together and talk about them while we were writing and then sometimes we'd watch them together but this particular instance we had both watched the butterfly effect on our own and we came together and we started talking about you know the end of the movie and james shared his ending with me and i was like what that's that's not how the movie ended <laughs> And then we sit, you, it was this, we actually have it on recording because we recorded our writing sessions, but we had this, this kind of back and forth moment where we're both realizing that there's, there may be multiple endings to this movie. And then we looked it up and there were like four different endings or something like that, that had been released nationwide. Uh, and such a, such a, such a funny, funny kind of, kind of moment there. Uh, Cause like his ending, like I was like, why on earth would a fetus strangle itself in the wound? Like that makes, that's such a, 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 that's such a a vivid, like uh, uh, sensory thing. Like, why would they do that? (laughs) And then I had seen the ending where they, they walk past each other and then maybe they recognize each other. And so what you can kind of like on that recording, you can kind of see where we're, we're finding our own story too. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And I, I specifically remember because back in the days when DVDs were a thing and deleted scenes yeah. actually kind of meant something, there was, uh, I watched the director's commentary and he said that he really likes the one where they, they walk past each other because if they had gotten together, his, his standpoint was they would have learned nothing from all of this. So yes. in a way, having to distance yourself 
in the hopes of coming together is more important than just going after what you want. So a lot of heady stuff, but, um, yeah. to, you know, to round this out, stuff in film. Yeah. So speaking of that, you had the, I would say maybe the most sage person on set is probably Danny Glover. Um, what, Absolutely. what was that casting <laughs> process? Like, how was it working with him? And, and do you just let Danny be Danny? You know, you let Danny be Danny for sure. Uh, mm -hmm. The first time, so w I knew him from films uh, such as um, Dumbo Drop and Angels in the Outfield as a kid. Those were the films that I watched. I didn't watch Lethal Weapon. I had no idea that he was in this like action hero movie. <laughs> and so I, when I, when I, I, I knew he was in it and I'd seen the movies previously. When I talked to him on the, on the phone for the first time after we had cast him, um, he we we had like a 10 minute phone call he called me up out of the blue i thought i was expecting his call at a later date but i i got a call out of the blue from an oakland number and he he goes hey is this greg and i was like yeah and he's like it's danny baby and i was like oh my god this is amazing so we talked for like 10 minutes he was walking on the streets of new york uh he got recognized three times and then at the end of that phone call or at the third time uh near the end of the phone call he uh he this guy that recognized him was so enthusiastic for having found legendary pokemon danny glover that he was like off the moon like like he he was in outer space at that point and danny threw him or me i'm not sure who uh, i think he threw this to 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 uh to the guy who found him he was like I'm getting too old for this shit. And I was like, Oh my God. He said the line he like Danny encompasses what you want out of somebody who is in that position. Like he mm -hmm. is, uh, the embodiment of, you know, this, he, he's embraced the pop culture aspect to his, his characters. And, you know, that's, it's such a charming thing um and he's such a charming person i think that he's one of those people that if you have him as your hero it's totally fine meeting him like do not be you will not be disappointed he's one of the, the warmest human beings that i've met uh in this industry he's amazing but yeah working with him he's a pain in the ass no i'm just kidding he's he's amazing he's, he's honestly he's, he's he, he he made that experience such a warm positive one for me Excellent. And, and I think that, that his what he was able to bring to the role, even in his limited screen time, when he talked about his wife and running that record store, just the, you, you kind of yeah. like feel there's actors who were legitimate just by walking on screen and like he mm -hmm. just sort of exudes. So um, that's a thank you for that story, Greg. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think the last question for you is more of a technical um, tidbit. Um, sure. I know that in the movie, Laura had a tr had trouble rewinding the tape, which is actually a really cool way to, you know, limit the amount of time she could go back and try to fix things. Yeah. Um, but I, I remember being a child, I had a couple Sony Walkmans, but I also got this weird off brand Walkman from my aunt that did not have okay. a rewind. It was only fast forward. So no nobody ever thought to have her flip the tape and fast forward because you fast forward one way and it what? rewinds the other way so did that ever yeah. come up so we uh we wrote it in a way and uh shot it in a way where she doesn't know that there's a, another side to the tape because she's she's of that generation <laughs> um but you know having a taking the tape out and trying to rewind it you know i know that there's a rewind button and there's a fast forward button but uh you know i i think that her character in that moment is not thinking 100% clearly. She probably doesn't understand that there's another side to a tape. Although, you know, you can kind of just <laughs> flip it over to see it. But, you know, it worked for it worked for the purposes of our story and, and trying to get her to, uh, you know, kind of understand about uh, second chances and stuff. So, yes, there is there are those that, you, that know that you can flip it over and just fast forward it. But I think that there was also like an aspect to the to the tape that probably wouldn't let her even if she did. Yeah. So that's I just was trying to be goofy. Well, Greg, <laughs> thank you so much for your time. I really got a lot from this. So uh, everyone check out Greg's fantastic movie. Press play any way you can go to the store, rent it, stream it, but make sure you press play and don't stop till it's over.